Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. If it's morning, afternoon, whatever the correct greeting is for the time where you are. All right, well, it is uh, 11.30 where we are, which is the starting time. And since we, as ever, have more questions than we really have time for, and I know some of you would like to ask questions uh, live, why don't we go ahead and get started with a little housekeeping to begin. Begin with a little introduction of who the ICCP is and what we do for any of you who may be joining us for the first time. So who is the ICCP? We are uh, the Institute of Construction Claims Practitioners which is a professional organization to recognize the skills, qualifications, and expertise in the professional management of construction claims. So our three key objectives are to establish international professional standards, to give recognition to those who have gained the appropriate knowledge and experience, and to educate those who wish to gain the experience and knowledge for the correct management of claims. So why is there a need for the ICCP when there are so many uh, professional construction institutes? Well, there are many construction institutes, but many people come to construction claims from a variety of backgrounds, from engineering, QS, project management, so on and so forth. And there is no organization other than the ICCP which deals exclusively with claims. Okay, so we were established to recognize that specialist knowledge, experience, and skills that is needed to manage, prepare, and respond to claims with the highest level of professionalism. Okay, um, because I want to give Paul as much time as possible, I'm not going to introduce the steering committee other than to say uh, they are elected by the membership and um, I will just point out that Paul Gibbons, our current president, will be giving today's uh, answers to your questions. Okay, so a little bit about membership. We have three levels of individual membership, each of which has its own um, levels of experience and qualifications needed to qualify. And we also have corporate membership for corporations that would like to provide membership for their claims department or for obviously consultancies that specialize in claims. So what are the benefits of membership? What's in it for you? Well, we have a private member area which has uh, a knowledge library of white papers, case studies, papers on uh, claims related topics we also have information about education and training opportunities. We have a bookshop which shows the latest releases in the industry. Uh, what I think is probably one of the biggest benefits is our template library, which has everything from a complete claim document to a number of uh, temp excuse me, templates related to notices, uh, different kinds of site reports, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, our most recent uh, addition to the member area is the ICCP Academy, which is sort of a short technical focused uh, webinars on very practical topics so that members can immediately benefit uh, in their workplace. Uh, other benefits include um, a discount from our training partner claims class. We have um, discounts with publishers Wiley, Blackwell, and Rutledge. We have a monthly newsletter to keep members up to date on everything new with the ICCP in the members area and more generally within the industry. Uh, we also, of course, have uh, a certificate which shows your designation, your post nominals, and a logo which you can use on your email signature, profile, CV, et cetera. Um, an optional benefit is the register of claims practitioners for consultants who would like to increase their online profile. And if you would like 
more information, please uh, get in touch with me, jennifer.smith at instituteccp.com. I'll answer any questions you have because I know I just went through that at the speed of light, but I wanted to give Paul as much time as he could have. So with that, I will hand it over to ICCP president, Paul Gibbons. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, great to see you all, um, wherever you may, may well be. Um, just to avoid any confusion, I know that Jennifer's name is shown up as Nina. Uh, Nina is currently on maternity leave um, from the ICCP, so Jennifer uh, is, as, is helping us now for the foreseeable future. So it's great to have Jennifer explain about the ICCP, and it's great to have you all join us uh, today. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, be asked to speak and give my views on uh, a couple of things, a couple of questions that came in and that have, uh, we've been asked to look at again uh, as we ran out of time in previous sessions. So I'm aiming today to hopefully um, deal with um, the concurrency uh, and how that's dealt with in terms of um, uh, Malmaison, pre-Malmaison and post-Malmaison. I'm hopefully going to be have enough time to talk about the Society Construction Law Protocol and um, what their views are on the uh, on the on the uh, concurrency matters. There's also a question that came in uh, dealing with um, my experience of uh, being a claims and expert consultant um, and what are we doing in terms of keeping pace with digitalization in this new modern era. And are we actually applying it uh, correctly? And then the other one, there's a question that came in regarding overheads and uh, extensions of time. Um, so those are the things that I want to try and deal with in the next 23 or so minutes. It doesn't give us a lot of time. Um, so I'll, I'll kick off with the, with the concurrency. Um, what I would like to do is, um, let me just share this. Let me just bear with me. Okay. So hopefully you can see that. Now, I'm a great believer in a, in a picture paints a thousand words in terms of concurrency. And it's a very difficult topic. And you put several delay analysts in the same room and they'll always come up with different views. Um, but concurrency was dealt with uh, by John Marin QC when he stated that concurrent delay is when a period of project overrun, which is caused by two or more effective causes of delay, which are of approximately equal causative potency. And that was his view in terms of what he thought the concurrent delay was. And for a concurrent delay to exist, it must be true, well, true concurrency is very rare, in so much as you know, having an employer and a contractor um, delay happening concurrently, true concurrently, and, and the, the imposing impact of that. And as I say, you put opposing experts um, will always raise alternative causes of delay to negate and cast doubt over extension of time and loss and expense entitlement. And the SCL protocol, the uh, second edition, uh, February 2017, um, provides two alternative views on concurrency, and these are dealt with at, at paragraphs 10.7 and 10.10 .10 of, of the delay protocol. As I say, hopefully come on to that uh, shortly. So, as I say, a picture speaks a thousand words. So, it, the, the orthodox approach to concurrency, which was the Malmaison uh, matter, what I've done here is I've tried to um, explain to you uh, a simple um, program. Nice and simple in terms of its activities. We've got a substructure, superstructure, M&E finishes and a completion date. And you'll see here we've got a critical path going through the substructure and the superstructure, et cetera, et cetera. If we then look at this second uh, program here, the two events have happened. One of them is a relevant event, and I'm referring here to a, a JCT contract, that being an exceptionally inclement weather. And the other is a, a shortage of labor by the contractor. So you'll see here that the inclement weather, and hopefully you can see my cursor, the inclement weather uh, is, has impacted uh, at the same time that there's a shortage of labor. And it's meaning that the substructure uh, has been delayed in its commencement. As I say, you've got a relevant event and you've got a contractor delay. And what that does is it moves the, uh, the five day, there's five working days concurrent delay at the end. It shifts this completion date 
through the critical path, through the superstructure, and it moves it on by five days. This that being the five days of the uh, the inclement weather delay. So here, in terms of the Malmaison approach, even though the contractor had a shortage of labour at this particular time uh, in this event, the exceptionally inclement weather allowed the contractor to uh, claim an extension of time for the five days of the inclement weather delay. So that was uh, Malmaison. You then move the, uh, the, 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 the cases on and you've got Royal Brampton and Adyard uh, and Falcus and Saga Cruises. And again, what I've done here is I've, I've shown the same simple structure uh, or program, showing the substructure, the superstructure, and m and &E finishes. And in this instance, in this second program, I've shown the shortage of labor impacting 10 days after the substructure has been uh, completed. And what that does, obviously, it impacts on the superstructure works, which subsequently then pushes out the, 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 uh, the, 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 the M&E finishes. And here you've got a 10 day delay, contractor delay from the original plan completion date. So that, that, that little uh, milestone there is the uh, plan completion date. And this is the, uh, the, the updated completion date with the contractor's delay incorporated within it. And that obviously, as I said there, this is a, a contractor's delay and he is culpable for that. So we continue on and we bring in a variation to the steelwork. So exactly the same discipline, exactly the same activities. There's a shortage of labor happening here. At the same time of the shortage of labor, I have a variation to steelwork, which is happening. And, and the variation to steelwork, the effect of that ceases at the same time that the shortage of labor impact ceases. And therefore the relevant event being the variation to steel, to steel work occurs slightly later, but is equally delaying as the uh, shortage of labor. And in this instance, there is no concurrent delay. The completion date, this, uh, this 10 days here, which is resulting from the shortage of labor, is not delayed any further than would have already have been delayed uh, due to the shortage of labor. But in this scenario, let's, let's assume that the variation the relevant event is, is, it, is it the instructions received after the shortage of labor impact. And obviously here you've got variation to steel work coming in. It's a relevant event. And what it does is you have 10 days of contractor delay and you've got five days of employer delay. So in this instance, you've got concurrent delay. The completion date is delayed further and that already delayed by the, uh, the shortage of labor. And in this, con in this instance, you've got five days of entitlement due to, the, uh, due to the relevant event. So the delaying act must affect the critical path. The delaying act must cause actual delay to the progress of the works. The act must prevent the contractor from achieving an earlier completion date if earlier completion date would not have been met due to contracted delay, then no concurrency exists. Um, and the first event problem, uh, will, you know, will, the, will the new approach prevent parties from raising issues whilst awaiting the other side's delay to materialize? This has always been a debate, you know, do the um, do opposing parties wait and see, uh, you know, in terms of putting the, uh, the, their delays forward first, knowing that, knowing that um, in post Malmaison, there may well be, um, you know, uh, a, a, an entitlement to the contractor for delays where there may well be concurrency. A concurrency argument is often one on, the, on factual evidence rather than any form of delay analysis itself. And, and I um, always suggest that um, a reason pragmatic approach should be taken to understanding uh, concurrency on, on construction related projects. So that I appreciate is a um, whistle stop tour of um, the concurrency th th shown through uh, graphical representation as opposed to um, you know bullet points and hopefully that very simplistic view 
um, allows you to understand uh, concurrency and uh, my, you know, my views on, on, on the pre and post Malmaison. Moving on to um, how the SCL deals with the uh, concurrent delay. Well, as I've already stated, the second edition 2017 um, it gives two differing views uh, at, uh, at section ten, paragraph 10.7 and uh, uh, two 10.10 10 actually. And what it says is that where there are two um, competing views as to whether an employer delay is an effective delay to completion and where it occurs after the commencement of the contractual delay to completion, but continues in parallel with the contractual delay, um, then this needs to be illustrated and they give an example. Um, but the example they give is, is that where a contractor, contractor's risk event uh, results in, say, five weeks delay to completion, and with it being a contractor's risk delay event, the contract is delayed, let's say, from um, 21st of January through to the 25th of Feb. And then a few weeks later, a variation is instructed on behalf of the employer, which in the absence of the preceding contractor delay to completion would have resulted in the employer's delay to completion from the 1st of Feb to the 14th of Feb, then one view in the SCL protocol says that um, both the contractor and the employer events are effective causes of delay to completion for the two week period, that being the 1st to the 14th of Feb. And as each has caused delay to the completion date in the absence of each other, then you have the contractor delay from the 15th of Feb to the 25th of Feb, and that is the contractor delay element. And in the old English courts, which predate the, which predate the delay analysis techniques, um, they stated that failure to complete the works is due in part as a fault of the employer and of the contractor, and that ergo liquidated damages will flow. The other view in the protocol states that um, that where the employer delay will not result in the works being completed later than would otherwise have been the case, because the works were already going to be delayed by a greater period of concurrent delay, then the only effective cause of delay is the contractor's risk event. And this is the current view of the English courts that I've alluded to uh, in my uh, slides, in my presentation. The protocol um, at paragraph 10.10 10 recommends the alternative view, this, the, second, the second view, the most recent view, um, and that is that where an EOT relating to the delay above is being assessed, then the employer risk event should be seen as not causing delay to completion and therefore no concurrency. And concurrent delay only arises where the employer risk event is shown to have caused a delay on the critical path. And that is really important to, to fully understand, you know, delays on the critical path and, um, and how they should be dealt with. And, it's, and, and equally, it's updating um, your program regularly uh, with what's actually happening, happening on the project from not only the employer's perspective, but also from the contractor's perspective. I was on a, 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 a meeting this morning with a client and they have um, not necessarily up, kept up to speed updating the program regularly because they didn't want to, they didn't want to um, declare to the employer what was happening in terms of the effects of delays on the project and the effect that was going to have, have on the completion date. And they've, what they've done is they've taken the links out of the, um, out of the program and they've kept the completion date the same, um, but equally um, they have, uh, you know, caused themselves an issue now because they've realized that delay has been suffered. Now then there may well be some concurrent delays on this project, we don't know. And we'll have to, you know, have a look at that retrospectively around the methodology that we adopt in our delay analysis. The protocol also goes on to say that, um, and as I've already alluded to, that, you know, a common sense approach must really be taken uh, in terms of dealing with concurrency and, and was it actually true concurrency and what are the reasons for it? <clears throat> So that gives you um, hopefully a, a very high level view. Um, it is a more difficult topic than that, um, but I appreciate and I'm sure you do that uh, we've only got a limited amount of time today to discuss, but hopefully that gives you an, you know, an overview of the uh, pre malmaison and post malmaison approach, approach to concurrency and how the SCL uh, deals with it. 
So moving on then to the next question that I was asked, and that was with regards to um, consultants, um, dispute consultants, experts, claims consultants, um, how are we keeping a pace um, with digitalization in this current uh, era of the post pandemic? Um, well, I think it's safe to say that um, COVID-19 has, has forced us all in the engineering and construction industry to rethink how we manage and track projects. And in the past, there have been uh, manual paper-based processes which have been prevalent in the industry. Uh, that will be by um, the, the old mandrolic allocation sheets, the site diaries, um, being maintained by the supervisors at the coal face, sometimes not being maintained at all. Sometimes those records get lost, they get, um, they, you know, they, they get torn, paper gets mislaid, et cetera, et cetera. And those contemporaneous records are, aren't there to rely upon. And this would often lead to a lack of efficiency, um, uh, uh, you know, around, you know, how we can maintain that information. But also, I think in this post-pandemic uh, period, maintaining and having people visit sites on a regular basis and maintaining social distance, distancing measures um, has, has meant that you know, there's been a reduced workforce in the, in the, in the construction work field. And that obviously needs to be taken into consideration. How do you record accurately what's going on if... Um, we haven't maintained good accurate records because we all know that to demonstrate and to show entitlement, we need to demonstrate the records that have been maintained contemporaneously and which um, reliance can be, uh, can be made upon. So it's difficult if you haven't got those paper based, how do we then update that? <clears throat> well, I think the industry has embraced uh, new workflow practices and processes in terms of online technology, We've seen it on a number of construction sites where they use um, drone modeling. Uh, they, they send a drone up, um, which is on a set GPS uh, each day, each week. That tracks um, progress on the project in terms of what's physically been happening from a pictorial view. We've seen uh, projects where uh, the supervisors have got instant you know, uh, iPads and they're able to put in uh, progress uh, against specific activities within the program. And that's always useful. You know, when I first got into the industry, you'd have a, a record sheet that said uh, an activity was delayed, but that activity was never, ne was never necessarily tied back to the original program or the work break breakdown structure activity ID. And you'd always be guessing, well, which part of the program was this, um, uh, you know, impacting? So we're seeing that technology is being embraced, got a long way to go. I think, you know, it's it's easy. It is easy, easy. Sorry, it is easy for us to follow outdated plans and schedules, um, but I think to avoid unnecessary delays and and wasted effort, I think we should all look to adopt um, the current thinking, information flow, uh, and and how we can make life more efficient moving forward. I think the other thing that helps in this regard is um, centralizing communications. So we, we have seen on many projects the use of CMAR. <clears throat> We've seen the use of A-Sight and, and Foresight being good work platforms. Now, this obviously eliminates the need um, for long email threads. And it should aid in information finding quite quickly uh, where there's going to be letters, where there's notifications issued, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it, 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 indeed, it does, um, you know, make life a lot easier. But be aware of this. When it, the, the com central communications are all well and good, <clears throat> when the parties are working collaboratively, but when one party falls out with the other and the other party has control over the use of the information portal, then that can cause problems. And we had this situation on a project a number of years ago where the, um, the, we were working for a subcontractor and they were working with the contract for the contractor and they were using uh, a, a, an Akinex type format and um, they fell out and all of the subcontractor's information was on the, um, the Akinex 
and the contractor decided that he didn't like the he, he didn't like what the subcontractor was saying, so he turned off access to the Akinex site for our client. So our client couldn't get access to his programs and notifications, the letters. They weren't, you know, we just couldn't see them. So we had to trot off and we had to get that, um, an, in, an injunction to get that information released through the courts. That was achieved. That information was then released. Uh, and then obviously the situation we then find ourselves is in, well, what information has been deleted? Because, you know, my client didn't have a snapshot, didn't take a, didn't take a picture of what information there was on that, that Akinex server before um, it was turned off and access, access was turned off. And there was difficulties around, you know, information finding and the, our client was saying, well, I, I thought, I thought I did I issued a notice. I'm sure I did issue a notice, but I can't find it. Well, you know, <clears throat> there was um, debate around, well, was it deleted um, intentionally? Was it deleted by accident? Who knows? Uh, the, eventually, the, both parties um, settled before it, before it got out of hand. But it just goes to show how using an information protocol like Akinex or CMAR is good, but equally bear in mind that what happens if you fall out and, and access to that information is turned off. I mean, as I say, that's um, that's something which uh, I've seen personally play out and has been quite problematic. So that deals with uh, digitalization and, and how we deal with um, information as consultants uh, managing delays in projects. <clears throat> the final one that I wanted to deal with um, was with regards to, and it's a question that came in um, late last night and I'll just read it out on, on the bit of paper that I've got in front of me. It says, um, I'll break, break it down. It says, I've, I'm having problems regarding prolongation costs in an extension of time period. Um, and it's basically saying, um, can the contractor claim for, an, uh, for the overhead costs in an extension of time uh, due to exceeding the bill of quantities quantity? Uh, and this individual goes on to say that I'm working on a road construction project uh, based on the FIDIC 99 Red Book as a condition of contract. Um, I guess the, the thing to, to work, to look at here is, is the entitlement to the bill of quantities increasing? Does that entitle you to claim additional uh, quantities? Is it a remeasurable con uh, contract? I don't know. I need to look at the red book in terms of, it's not my, uh, FIDIC is not my expert uh, expertise, um, but uh, maybe that's one for Andy Hewitt who is who's the executive of the ICCP. But in the normal sense of the word, I would be saying that if, if the contract gave you an entitlement to recover uh, additional quantities outside of the contract quantities, and that then causes you to be on site for a longer period of time, then that additional quantities will entitle you to, um, to an extension of time with the appropriate uh, prolongation costs. I guess the alternative to that is if the um, if the if the bill of quantities is a lump sum quantity, and all that risk sits on the contractor for all of the quantities, and he, and he and he's carrying out more quantities than what than what was originally envisaged, then there will be no entitlement to an extension of time and the costs that will flow from that because the contractor, as part of the contract, um, took on board the risk of that lump sum and the quantities that were, were, were aligned to that. So hopefully uh, that's answered or given you two views with regards to answering that question. Um, so uh, that brings me nearly a minute to go uh, before the end of the session. Um, I'm gonna jump in with just a quick one uh, on the slide for the alternative or new approach by Royal Brompton, please confirm whether no currency is from the employer's or contractor's perspective. So you got, you, so in this instance, you have a concurrent delay, which is, which is predominantly um, driven by, you got a contractor's scenario concurrent, uh, happening with the employer's scenario and where the, um, where the employer's element is impacting, you will get the concurrent delay effects of that and the, and the costs associated with it. Okay, and one last one, if you can squeeze in 30 seconds. 
In terms of dealing with consecutive claims from the contractor side, i.e. introducing a new claim to the engineer while a previous one has already been submitted, what is the best way of dealing with delay analysis? How do we go with it? Do we calculate both EOTs separately when preparing each claim and combine at a later stage? Or which method or approach of delay analysis is better? Oh, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a question for another another. <laughs> oh, is it okay? Is that a? Well, but it, it just, I mean, we. Um, so I would always say that where you have um, a progressive impact of delay to a project, we would always say bring the project up to a specific period of time with your delay analysis. So call that claim one. You would then update that with the further delays that have been impacted and you would issue uh, a claim two, which will be an addenda. So basically, you know, as, as you know, you're given one document to the engineer to consider or the project manager, depending on what kind of contract it's under, you would say, to, you would say up to that point in time, uh, I'm asking for so many weeks delay as a result of these, these um, causative uh, events and at that point in time, I'm looking for, you know, there's a drop down, this is it. Then post that period of time, there's more delays happening. And then you'd issue an addenda and you'd basically be saying, you know, the, the engineer or the PM might not have responded in that, in that intervening time. So you'd then submit your addenda claim number two, number three, number four, whatever it may well be. And uh, as an add on, um, and you use the same delay analysis approach that you've initiated in the first delay uh, analysis that you did. You just update it uh, with, you know, with what's been happening uh, and playing out. Um, each project is, you know, has its own um, delay analysis and, you know, each, each, depending on where it's at. So that's where we are. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we actually got through all the questions today. Yay. Super. That's right. great. Excellent. Right. Great so, to, uh, well, great to great to see everybody on the on the webinar. Hope you found it uh, of, of use. And uh, Jen, I'll hand over to you. Yep, yeah, I'll um, I'll get this up on YouTube and on the website in the next couple of days. And if I could get the slides from you, Paul, as well, to post along with it. Super. Okay. Good to see you all. Take care. Bye bye now. Right, thank you very much. Bye.